we are back for Overanalyzing House of the Dragon, a series that explains how we end up at the Dance of the Dragons, that is, Rhaenyra's Blacks versus Aegon's Greens. In our first four parts, we found out that the Valarians were repeatedly shafted, with Aemon dying, Rhaenys being passed over, and then after Balon dies, a great council being called instead of Rhaenys being named the rightful heir. And then in part five, we'll get a story about Corlys Valarian. And now let's continue. Unsurprisingly, the Sea Snake was bitterly disappointed when Prince Aemon died and King Jaehaerys bypassed Aemon's daughter Rhaenys in favor of his brother Balon, the Spring Prince. But now it seemed the wheel had turned again and the wrong could be righted. Thus did Corlys and his wife, the Princess Rhaenys, arrive at Harrenhal in high state, using the wealth and influence of House Valarian to persuade the lords assembled that their son Laenor should be recognized as heir to the Iron Throne. In these efforts, they were joined by the Lord of Storm's End, Borman Baratheon, great-uncle to Rhaenys and great-great-uncle to the boy Laenor, by Lord Stark of Winterfell, Lord Manderley of White Harbor, Lord Dustin of Barrowton, Lord Blackwood of Raventree, Lord Bar Emmon of Sharp Point, Lord Celtigar of Claw Isle, and others. They were nowhere near enough. The Lord and Lady Valarian were eloquent and open-handed in their efforts on behalf of their son, the decision of the Great Council was never truly in doubt. By a lopsided margin, the lords assembled chose Viserys Targaryen as the rightful heir to the Iron Throne. Though the maesters who tallied the votes never revealed the actual numbers, it was said afterward that the vote had been more than 20 to 1. And so after our detour, we return to the Great Council of 101, where we once again see that Gildane is being dishonest with us. Now look, at this point you're probably sick of hearing me say that Rhaenys has the best claim and that it makes no sense that Laenor's claim was put forward first and that the whole shift from talking about Rhaenys to talking about Laenor is a Weasley telling of history by a heavily biased Gildane. And yeah, I'm sick of talking about it, but the text keeps hammering this point over and over again. So here Gildane says that House Valarian arrived at Harrenhal with the intention of pushing Laenor's claim which would match Gildane's earlier claim that Corlys was massing ships for his son, or Gildane's earlier claim that Rhaenys was upset with the choosing of Balon as it usurped the rights of her son. But we know this to be flat out false. In fact, Gildane's whole explanation on how things went is just a lie. So first of all, we know that Rhaenys' claim was put forward. We were specifically told that her claim was put forward, and later in the text we find out that Stark, Dustin, and Manderly all spoke for Rhaenys. And why wouldn't Rhaenys' claim be put forward? It's the best claim, and it was such a big deal that it caused the second quarrel. She is the rightful heir. And a 20 to 1 margin? We actually find out later that a 20 to 1 margin is the same number listed as the vote of male claimants over female claimants, which probably means if we add up all of the votes for all of the men, we get 20 to 1. Maybe. 20 to 1 is so lopsided that we are in the range of sham dictator election figures. Whatever the case, 20 to 1 is most definitely not the vote tally of Viserys over Laenor, as we get a fairly extensive list of lords supporting Laenor, including great lords like Stark and Baratheon. It's just not believable that the great lords would vote for a house and none of their bannermen would. And if the vote were so lopsided that it was 20 to 1, why not release the final vote numbers? Why not show that their heir is broadly supported by the lords? The hiding of the tally shows that either it was close, or in fact, Laenor was the true winner. We can also look to other parallel elections in Ice and Fire to figure out what likely happened. At the King's Moot, for example, the biggest problem was that Victarion and Asha split the vote, allowing Euron to defeat them. Asha was the most reasonable candidate and chosen by Balon, however Victarion was male and was backed by the religious. Had only one of them run, they would have probably beaten Euron. Additionally, in the Lord Commander election, Cotter Pike and Dennis Malister are both well qualified. Had only one of them run and they weren't trying to stop each other, they would have won against Janice Slint or John. But again, they split the vote. And so it's rather relevant that both Rhaenys and her son Laenor are put forward along with a dozen other claimants. There seems to have been a splitting of the vote. Had it just been Rhaenys against Viserys and there wasn't Maester interference, it seems likely that she would have won. I think it's likely there was a first round of voting with the following vote tallies. Laenor getting 40%, Vagon getting 30%, after all he is a wise learned man who would probably make the best ruler, 
And then Viserys probably got 5% and Rhaenys got 5%. Though Rhaenys' 5% is misleading, as Laenor voters would have likely voted for Rhaenys as a second choice. And then the other claimants each got around 2-3%, with Lena getting close to nothing. With this result, one can claim that Rhaenys is unpopular and should be disqualified. The vote for male claimants over female is 20 to 1. But in a straight up race between Rhaenys and Viserys, she might grab the Vagon vote, that is, people looking for a good ruler, and the Laenor vote, people who favor House Valarian. But instead, reasons are found to disqualify Vagon, Rhaenys, and everyone else. Viserys captures the Vagon vote because he would make the better ruler over a boy. What is lost in this process is how unpopular Viserys actually was. He's only popular when you disqualify everyone else and only have him run against a boy. And in the end, the maesters still probably cheated. Laenor probably actually won. King Jaehaerys had not attended the council, but when word of their verdict reached him, his grace thanked the lords for their service and gratefully conferred the style Prince of Dragonstone upon his grandson Viserys. Storm's End and Driftmark accepted the decision, if grudgingly, the vote had been so overwhelming that even Laenor's father and mother saw that they could not hope to prevail. In the eyes of many, the Great Council of 101 AC thereby established an iron precedent on matters of succession. Regardless of seniority, the Iron Throne of Westeros could not pass to a woman, nor through a woman to her male descendants. So here we find that Storm's End and Driftmark accept the decision, in the end, the ruse of the Great Council of 101 was pretty impressive. The Valarians had the better claim, they had the fleet, and they likely had the support of around half of Westeros, but they bought the story that they were massively unpopular in the Seven Kingdoms. That, or they didn't want to get murdered by the Lannister and Tyrell forces that were brought to the Great Council, though their fight was far from over. Now what is rather hilarious with this passage is that Maester Gildane tries to claim that there is an iron precedent of the Great Council of 101 barring women from rule, or at least in the mind of the nameless eyes of many. This claim is in the same vein as Gildane's well-established precedent of Balon being chosen over Rhaenys. It's hogwash. Of course there was no iron precedent. The Council of 101 was a single ruling about Laenor versus Viserys, and in the end, it was still Jaehaerys' choice to follow it or not. Nowhere was it said that the council was going to be establishing a precedent, and even if it did, that precedent was ignored just two years later when Viserys made Rhaenyra his heir, and there was little, if any, grumbling from the lords of Westeros at that time. It's again important to note that there has never been a precedent or consistent system for Targaryen succession ever, and the Council of 101 only has relevance at perhaps one other moment in history, and that's after the death of Baelor the Blessed. Rather than the throne going to his sister, it goes to his uncle, but this is mainly because Baelor's sister had no political allies, and Viserys II, who became king, had been acting as hand for many years. There is no point in history where people sit around and say, yes, that's the law, and follow the Council of 101. It just doesn't work that way. And while the Council of 101 is mentioned later for the Dance of the Dragons, it's actually not a very important plot point. Yes, one can interpret the ruling as a way to disqualify Rhaenyra, but she already had the weaker claim according to Westerosi's succession. Aegon II was her brother, and sons come before daughters. Albeit there might be some discussion about children of the first wife over children of the second wife. The Council of 101 would perhaps be more of a plot point for the modern story, with people wondering about Daenerys' claim over young Griffs, but even then, young Griff is heir according to Westerosi's succession, the son of the first son. In the end, for as much as it's talked about, the Council of 101 is actually something that can be more or less forgotten. Yes, it was rigged, and yes, the Valarians were cheated, but we have a long list of these riggings and cheatings. The real issue going forward into the Dance of the Dragons and the modern story is whether a chosen heir, that is, Rhaenyra and Daenerys, should come before those in succession, Aegon and Aegon. Of the last years in the reign of King Jaehaerys, little and less need to be said. Prince Balon had served his father as Hand of the King, as well as Prince of Dragonstone, but after his death, his grace elected to divide those honors. As his new hand, he called upon Sir Otto Hightower, younger brother to Lord Hightower of Old Town. Sir Otto brought his wife and children to court with him, and served King Jaehaerys faithfully for the years remaining to him. As the old king's strength and wits began to fail, he was oft confined to his bed. Sir Otto's precocious 15-year-old daughter, Alicent, became his constant companion, fetching his grace his meals, reading to him, 
helping him to bathe and dress himself. The old king sometimes mistook her for one of his daughters, calling her by their names. Near the end, he grew certain that she was his daughter Sarah, returned to him from beyond the narrow sea. Now it's at this point of Fire and Blood that we cross over into it being a newer version of The Rogue Prince. The Rogue Prince was published in 2014, while Fire and Blood was published in 2018. And it shows. The writing style for this section is different, and I do believe the Rogue Prince information has more allusions and more hidden information. I think our author spent more time with the material and tried harder with it. And comparing this 2018 version with the material from 2014 is also very interesting. So here we find that our author has put in a few retcons, as the Rogue Prince starts out a little differently. This is how the Rogue Prince begins. He was the grandson of a king, the brother of a king, husband to a queen. Two of his sons and three of his grandsons would sit the Iron Throne, but the only crown that Daemon Targaryen ever wore was the crown of the Stepstones, a meager realm he made himself with blood and steel and dragon fire, and soon abandoned. Over the centuries, House Targaryen has produced both great men and monsters. Prince Daemon was both. In his days, there was not a man so admired, so beloved, so reviled in all Westeros. He was made of light and darkness in equal parts. To some, he was a hero, to others, the blackest of villains. No true understanding of that most tragic bloodletting known as the Dance of the Dragons is possible without a consideration of the crucial role played before and during the conflict by this rogue prince. The seeds of the Great Conflict were sown during the last years in the long reign of the Old King, Jaehaerys I Targaryen. Of Jaehaerys himself, little need to be said here, save that after the passing of his beloved wife, Good Queen Alysanne, and his son Balon, Prince of Dragonstone, Hand of the King, and heir apparent to the Iron Throne, his grace was but a shell of a man that he had been. With Prince Balon lost to him, the Old King had to turn elsewhere for a partner in his labors. So, as I said, in here there are some big changes. So, originally in The Rogue Prince, Balon dies and Jaehaerys goes crazy after that and brings in Otto Hightower immediately, which means the Council of 101 was likely Otto Hightower's idea. However, in Fire and Blood, Jaehaerys goes nuts a decade earlier after the death of Aemon, not Balon. And it's implied in Fire and Blood that the Council has already happened and Viserys has been named heir before Otto Hightower arrives. And of course, the whole idea for the council is given to Vagon in Fire and Blood. Previously, one could attribute nearly all of the scheming to the High Towers at this opportune moment, but now a larger Old Town conspiracy implemented over many years is really necessary to make the pieces fit. The other change to this paragraph is the addition of the adjective precocious here in Fire and Blood for Alicent Hightower. This was not in the Rogue Prince. Precocious means to develop earlier, which on the one hand is supposed to make Alicent seem intelligent for her age, but of course, when applied to a teenage girl, is also going to imply something about her sexual development. And of course, it's rather significant that she is paired with Sarah Targaryen. Without a good background on Sarah, which we didn't have when the Rogue Prince was released, one might think that Jaehaerys simply missed his daughter and had regrets about her. Except now at the release of Fire and Blood, we know that Jaehaerys was actually quite stubborn, hostile, and insulting towards Sarah. We know that Sarah, when 14, wanted to be queen, either the Queen Beyond the Wall or the Queen of Dorne, and when she was 15, Alison's age, she became rather boy-crazy and was likely sexually active. This behavior made her father Jaehaerys call her a prostitute. So what our author is likely saying is that Jaehaerys sensed who Alison was, at least subconsciously, an ambitious woman who would use her sexuality to her advantage. Now, of course, it's also a bit weird and creepy that Alicent is helping Jaehaerys dress and bathe when other servants can certainly do that, but it shows that she is willing to be around gross, naked old men to get what she wants. Though Viserys, who she will marry, was only 11 years her senior. Mushroom, the court fool, claims in his writing that Alicent had sex with Jaehaerys, but he also claims she had sex with Daemon Targaryen. Everyone was having sex in Mushroom's account. Mushroom also seems to have been brought in under the reign of Viserys, so it's unlikely he actually knew what was transpiring under the reign of Jaehaerys anyway. In the year 103 AC, King Jaehaerys I Targaryen died in his bed as Lady Alicent was reading to him from Septon Barth's On Natural History. His grace was 9 and 60 years of age and had reigned over the Seven Kingdoms since coming to the Iron Throne at the age of 14. His remains were burned in the Dragon Pit, his ashes interred with good Queen Alysanne's on Dragonstone. 
All of Westeros mourned, even in Dorne, where his writ had not extended, men wept, and women tore their garments. Next, we hear about Alicent reading to Jaehaerys as he lays dying. Now, this reading is rather interesting on a few fronts. First, it is specifically said later on that it's Alicent's reading to Jaehaerys that caught Viserys' eye. He apparently viewed her as a caring individual from this act and falls for her. But it's also quite striking that the book she reads is Unnatural History. This book we know is chock-filled with information on dragon biology from Septon Barth's research. The full name of the tome is actually Dragons, Worms, and Wyverns, Their Unnatural History, with Unnatural History being our author's play on Pliny the Elder's work, Natural History. The book is so revealing on dragons that it's later condemned by the Citadel and banned by King Baelor. In the modern story, Tyrion remarks that no complete copies have survived. However, since Dorne wasn't in the Seven Kingdoms when Baelor ordered the destruction of the book, Doran Martell appears to have a copy, and Ariane Martell later tries to read the book in her tower but finds it boring. Now, why this book is being read is a mystery. Did Jaehaerys want to hear from it? If so, why? What use would Barth's knowledge do Jaehaerys on his deathbed? It seems more likely that Alicent wanted to read from it to learn something about dragons. Now, we also hear that Jaehaerys' ashes were interred on Dragonstone. It's notable that certain characters with very good claims to the Iron Throne were denied having their ashes on Dragonstone. Dreamfire Reyna and her daughters were not interred there, and we hear nothing of Rhaenys being interred there either. She was probably brought to Driftmark. And Rhaenyra has no tomb, as she was eaten by a dragon. And we also hear about everyone mourning Jaehaerys, even down in Dorne where they ripped their garments. This is, of course, ridiculous. There's no reason for anyone in Dorne to like Jaehaerys, but the lie about ripping garments does remind one of Jane Westerling's melodramatic and rebellious tearing of her dress, and Obara Sand's hyperbolic claim that Dorne mourned Oberyn Martell greatly with women ripping their hair out and sex workers refusing coin. A tearing of garments is seen as so dramatic that it's insincere. In accordance with his own wishes and the decision of the Great Council of 101, his grandson Viserys succeeded him, mounting the Iron Throne as King Viserys I Targaryen. At the time of his ascent, King Viserys was 26 years old. He had been married for a decade to a cousin, Lady Emma of House Arryn, herself a granddaughter of the old king and good Queen Alysanne, through her mother, the late Princess Dela, died 82 AC. Lady Emma had suffered several miscarriages and the death of one son in the cradle over the course of her marriage. Some maesters felt she had been married and bedded too young. But she had also given birth to a healthy daughter, Rhaenyra, born 97 AC. The new king and his queen both doted on the girl, their only living child. And so here we hear about Viserys taking the throne. Now it's notable that it's Jaehaerys' wish for Viserys to succeed him based on the Council of 101. Jaehaerys' wish being important, in the end succession still appears to be largely based on the choice of the monarch. Aenys may have chosen Magor, Magor certainly named a successor with Arya, and Jaehaerys chose Aemon, then chose Balon, and then chose Viserys. This is significant as, again, in just two years, Viserys would name Rhaenyra, showing that the Council of 101 did not change anything. Now we also hear about Viserys' first wife, Emma Arryn, and we get some very ambiguous writing. Still, her sad situation shows how desperate Viserys was in producing a male heir to balance Rhaenys' Lena and Laenor. You see, Emma Arryn was born in 82 and married to Viserys in 93 at the age of 11. Early marriages are always done out of political necessity. Rhaenys had given birth to Lena in 93 and was pregnant again. And then we hear about several miscarriages and a death of a son over the course of the marriage. Which is curious, you see, Emma Arryn does have a son after Rhaenyra that dies after one day, so one might think that the son in the passage is him. But no, the passage clearly links the death of this boy to the miscarriages and Emma being too young. Emma Arryn was certainly not too young for her later son. Not to mention, later on, Rhaenyra is called their only surviving child. This boy who died in the cradle is an additional son, which means she was really young when Viserys was bedding her. If Rhaenyra was born in 97, then Emma Arryn was 14 when she conceived her. But then we have another full pregnancy before that, which means that Emma was about 13 being bedded, 
and then several miscarriages. So yeah, essentially Viserys was betting a 12-year-old trying to get her pregnant in order to increase his legitimacy to the Iron Throne. And this is a good place to stop. We'll continue on in part 7 with the early reign of Viserys Targaryen. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.